been southbound, I've been hellbound, riding on the midnight train. Going too fast now, think I'll slow down, standing in the pouring rain. What's going on, guys? Tristan and Tony back with another episode of the One Hell of a Life Outdoor Podcast. And today we got on Chad Walagura, who is the owner and co-host of Able Outdoors. Um, and he's got some exciting news on that front. But uh, Chad reached out on social media a little bit ago. And um, as I've gotten to follow his page and stuff and uh, see what they do there at Able Outdoors, um, it was immediately somebody I was very excited to get to talk to. And it took us a little bit to nail down the date. But um, Chad, we are, we're you know super excited to have you on tonight. And thank you for taking the time out, man. Hey guys, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm always, I'm always down for talking outdoor stuff. So, that's <laughs> well. yeah, we were just talking off air. Chad's from Texas, deep in the heart of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. it's probably still nine hundred thousand degrees down there, huh? It's hot, but if you grow up here, I'm, I'm thin skinned now. I like it. I like it hot. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough, man. And and you know, y'all, uh, you guys, when you're listening to this, you got to immediately just jump on social media and and follow this message and story. I think you guys are in tune for something really cool tonight. And uh, the message here that Chad's got is just uh, um, is something that's humbling to me. And uh, uh, I can't wait to dig in and learn more about you tonight, bud. Well, hey, sounds good, buddy. Well, well, Chad, why don't you kind of give everybody just a little bit of background on, you know, what is Able Outdoors? You know, who are you and, um, you know, maybe how you got into the outdoors and where that love came from and all that good stuff. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, I was really lucky to grow up in the, in the time where my grandparents lived out in the country and I spent a lot of time on their little farm, you know, so I started with I thought every kid started with like a BB gun, pellet gun, and then we graduated to shotgun and 22. Don't forget about and, dirt claws and rocks. <laughs> yeah, the slingshots, or any, anything like that. I mean, kids don't kids don't get to do that these days. They and I, I, I think they're really missing out on that. Yeah, you, that's where your love of nature starts, and hunting and fishing starts my grandfather was a real big fisherman and nobody knows that but i was a i was a fisherman way before i was a hunter because I, I was the first grand boy for forever and he would pick me up on the weekend and go down to the coast and I, you know i was i was his fishing buddy for for my entire childhood which was which was really great for me a great way to grow up yeah yeah sounds like it so I got hurt when I was 17, diving into a pool. I, it's a boring story, but <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't, the water wasn't too shallow. I just hit my head just right on the incline, broke my neck. And mm. uh, the, the outdoors was really kind of what saved my life, you could say, because mm -hmm. the one thing, I, the one thing, I was telling my doctors in the hospital rehab, I was like, I was like, I can give up everything as long as I can still hunt and fish, which was true. Mm. So, mm. so I, I postponed a year of high school. I got home on Halloween actually. And I postponed a year just to figure out, you know, the internet was just a baby. There was nothing on there about adaptive outdoors. And so it was kind of up to me to figure out what I needed to do to to be able to do it. So we just we, we just kind of my dad loaded me up in his truck and we went to we tried to go deer hunt and we failed at everything we tried, which was it was such a looking back. It was it was kind of the best thing that happened because it, it gave me so many ideas on what I needed to do. Sure. Mm -hmm. For the next year. And so the next year I had a little bit of adaptive equipment made and it worked and I was able to figure out how to wing shoot. And then my, my rehab knew I was into outdoor stuff and, and they started calling because they had patients asking about hunting and fishing and they wanted me to come talk to them about it. I was like, yeah, sure. And I still do that today. That was 35 years ago. So that that's really what kind of led to 
Able Outdoors because I started a, a website called Follow Me Outdoors just to just to post mm -hmm. all the info I could find on adaptive equipment and and hunts and stuff I was doing. I hated writing. I hated English. <laughs> I hated writing. It it really it forced me to to get good at it because I mean for one it was a subject I really liked. I, you know. So I was interested in it, and that, that was the difference. So mm -hmm. I, it just kind of snowballed and grew over time. I was really lucky. I had a really good support system. So I was able to go on group hunts in other states. And, you know, it, just slowly but surely, the, you got to get out. That's the most important thing, it's just getting out there. It really is. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, that's the best therapy in the world out there. So n now I get to help other, other people get out. That's kind of my my main goal and is just to reach more people and with social media you can reach a lot of people now yeah yeah and i think you know i watched the video today um with the young lady down in texas where you guys started off with you know the turkeys and then went to the deer and she ended up getting that 10 pointer and uh you know you bring up the point about uh, you know adaptive technology and um i find that is interesting because you know i'm sure through Listen up, guys. Waterfowl season will be here before you know it, so book a hunt today. Williamson Outfitters offers exceptional duck hunting along Florida's Forgotten Coast, targeting redheads, bluebills, buffleheads, canvasbacks, and much, much more. Lodging and fishing packages are also available. Mention the One Hell of a Life podcast when booking and get 15% off your next trip. Spots are filling up fast, so call or text Captain Chris at 850-251-8650 or visit floridaducks.com through all the years that you've been hunting like you kind of built that toolbox of you you know you things that work for you and things like that so you can you know teach other people or suggest to other people and i thought it was interesting like you know with the shotgun she had the deal where it was like the uh the the airline or whatever to get the trigger to go off um, yeah that's super buff trigger yeah <laughs> and then the uh with the rifle it was a completely different setup where you guys had the a camera that was like basically mirroring what the inside of the scope looks like so that she could look at that to shoot. Um, yeah. and that's, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just interesting. And it's great that you're, you're such a resource for those different, you know, hunters and, um, all those, di you know, different types of guns and environments and all that good stuff, man. Don't, don't you hit the nail on the head with that. Um, you know, I'm just mind blown right now because honestly, my brain just opened up to a whole new sector of something that I did not expect to really dive into it mentally tonight. And that is, you know, it, everybody's got paints a pretty picture on social media, right? But you never see what it takes to get there, you know? And yeah, Tristan, I mean, 30, I'm, I'm 52 also, you know, and I'm thinking back 35 years of the stuff that I've learned and I'm thinking what that means to, folks that are disabled is just oh my god i mean everything some can seem hard to us if everything's perfectly fine but when you have these challenges and you have somebody to help you in that forward path i think is just dude you're Especially a stud with something like hunting you're a stud i mean you know, wow there's there's so much cool stuff out there now and it is my mind is always going i, I love a challenge now i love to to try to figure out, okay, how, how are we going to do this impossible thing? And it, it, I, I promise, I promise you it's all possible. You just, sometimes it takes a while to figure it out. Right. That That's one of the reasons I want to do the show is to show the whole process. Cause sometimes it takes a year or, or more to get it, to figure it all out. And, to, and, you know, you don't go out, you don't roll out of bed. And you don't roll out of bed and kill a big deer. I mean, Kayla right. did. She really, she really got lucky. <laughs> yeah. Well, she had to but, go through the <laughs> unsuccessful turkey trials to get there. Yeah. <laughs> and we all need luck. <laughs> I mean, it, it took it took showing up several times just to practice shooting to figure out what we were going to need. And, I mean, you just you just don't show up in a deer blind and shoot something. Uh, we we, we want to show what it takes to get there, what we do, how we do it. You know, a lot, a lot of times I'm the guide 
you know, we, and we take care of it. We, we can track our deer and take care of it after we shoot it. And I, I, I just want to show all that stuff. Cause it, I think that's interesting stuff. Yeah, no, dude. And you just touched on it. And so I want to go ahead and, and talk about that. Um, you got, now you got a, a TV show that you're working on, right? Yes, sir. Can't talk about that because that is gigantic news, right? Yes, we is just something I've been kind of, kind of had in mind a long time ago, you know, and with no idea of how we were going to get there ever. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I, we 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 started with a magazine about six seven years ago called Able Outdoors, and then. It didn't take off. I, I thought it was going to take off in the school libraries around the country, but it didn't. So it, we kind of shelved that idea. And then a friend of mine, my co-host from Wyoming, she's a pair and she, she's, she and I see an eye to eye on a lot of stuff, especially the, the mainstream outdoor shows and, and how we need, how they, they needed us. <laughs> they yeah. needed us out there. Yep. So, I called her up and I, and, I, and I said, her name's Ashley Lundvall. I said, Ashley, I'm, I'm 55. We need to get this thing going before I lose my looks. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. I'm already losing my hair. <laughs> I said, we need, we need to, we need to do this already. So she was on board. So and she, she found us a camera guy and, and, and we just, you know, I, I love, I love setting it all up. That's, I love setting up the location and the, and the logistics i love that part of it and the hunting too so we we've been shoot filming for two years and we we're finally going to get on carbon tv we're going to debut on september 5th able outdoors mm. on carbon tv so oh, that's hopefully, awesome. that, hopefully that's our next step up i hope so yeah, we'll you, see where it goes about two two and a half weeks from now that's right that's right that's Man. Just, uh, what a neat story, dude. That's just so cool. I mean, and, and it just goes to show you, you know, I mean, when, you know, you work hard at something, you know, and you persevere, um, sometimes it doesn't happen on your time. You know what I mean? It happens on a different oh, time. Right. And, uh, um, but that's huge. And, you know, before I lose track of this thought is, you know, you've had all these years in the woods, you know, and, Maybe even just times by yourself where you're out there and you're just thinking about stuff and you know how we daydream and, and get deep in thought about things. And you're, especially when you're deer hunting, you got a lot of extra time. And, you know, what's some of those, what's your probably, if you, if you had to pick one, what's, what's probably your biggest innovation, you know, whether it's, I mean, something that you just share with friends or something that you've gotten um, that's helped a ton of people, you know, what, what is something like Tristan talked about with that innovation that you did with the, with the, you know, helping her see the screen, you know, and stuff. I mean, what's something that you found that's been so applicable to so many people? Uh, the, well, the biggest thing for me, obviously, is I, I invented this trigger puller that I use that one that fits on the back of my hand. Mm -hmm. And cause I can't, I can't move my fingers. Not, not to pull the trigger so it's that has helped you know it's kind of a small niche but it's helped a lot of a lot of people who had no idea how they were going to pull the trigger i you know i just kind of sped the process up for them that in uh chest strap uh, chest straps that i use for wing shooting Th those two things i've i've gotten out there I'm, i mean there's a lot cooler more intricate devices out there, but fewer people use that. But mm -hmm. say, I mean, there's a rig that we use for shotgunning called a zero gravity rig. It, it, that's a cool rig too. It, it, it just takes the weight of the gun away for people who have really limited arm strength. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a cool thing, it, but it's, it's just more difficult. I mean, it's, it's more challenging, but it, it's doable. I mean, it, it allows some people to wing shoot, which is if you're that one person, that's huge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think, um, going back to what you said a little bit ago, Chad, with just kind of telling the whole, whole story of the hunt, you know, the blood trail and, you know, everything. That's one thing that kind of hits home with us because we've always been, we run a YouTube channel as well. And, um, we, 
one of our main missions from the very beginning was just to show the reality of like the good and the bad, you know, I mean, when boats break down or when this goes wrong or whatever, you know, you miss a deer, you know, those are the kind of things that we kind of felt with the outdoor TV that didn't get shown enough. So I definitely, that definitely hits home for us. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I, I said going in, we're going to show the misses. We're going to show, show the good and the bad. Hope, hopefully it won't be me missing, but <laughs> it, it, it happens. I yep. promise you. It well, happens to the, to the best shots I know. So 100%. Well, I, I will never, never feel bad about it when it happens. <laughs> yep. You, you know, I feel like there's, you know, there's two, there's two types of, of people out there and there's one type of people. And I'm not saying anything wrong about either side. I'm just saying there's just two stereotypes. And one is folks that just want to see the trophy, right? Um, they just want to see the end of the, the tennis match or the, the last round of the golf or the final three laps of NASCAR or whatever it is, right? Then you got some of us, and I'm saying some of us because I'm this person, is that I want to see everything it took to get there. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And... And and like Tristan said, you know, we're passionate about showing those things. And I got sick and tired of commercial TV. And they were just they were they were favoring the the other type of a person. Um, but you know, it just got to the point where when we adopt, when we um, what's the right way to say it? When when this new um, type of what do they call the newer ones, not the Gen X. What do you call them, Tristan? Gen Z. The Gen Zs. When they came around, I saw a CEO for a, a huge university in Florida um, speak about change and what it was going to, his vision of what it was going to take to adapt to this younger generation. And he's talking to the biggest CEOs in, in Florida. And he said to them, he said, you better be ready to do an interview in about five minutes and you better be able to keep them entertained whenever, you know, all these different things. They said, you better be ready for this workforce that's coming your way. It's different, right? Um, with the younger folks, you know, I got sick of them only seeing the trophy, so to speak, and then oh, yeah. going out there and trying to hunt and saying, I can't do it. And for what you're doing is you're opening in that same door for folks that have disabilities to go, man, I can do it, you know, and that's the reality of it. And this is doable. Uh, you're right. Though. I mean, there's, there's so much more to hunting than just, than just the pulling the trigger. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I mean, it, it, it's about being alone in nature a lot of times and just, sure. just being part of nature and, I mean, there's so much to see out there besides what you're going after. Mm -hmm. there's, there's so much cool stuff that happens. Just just, just pick a uh, deer hunting from a deer stand sometimes when you're sitting there quiet for two or three hours. There's so much to there's so much to see. And even if you don't see too many deer, kid some kids come back disappointed. I'm like, there's so, there's so many other things that you saw out there, just being alone, being quiet in nature, sitting still. It, it, yeah, it, it, it is different now because you because I mean, I, if it was me, I would. It's hard not to to take your phone out there, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And just to kind of occupy your time. But yeah, hunting has definitely changed. But I, I, on that note, you know, I'm so frustrated with a lot of the shows, hunting shows these days because they they do they don't show hardly any of the hunting. They're just, there's a lot of fluff. There's a lot of talk and there's a lot of other stuff. I want to see, I want to see the buildup, the, you know, the stuff that went into the hunt, the, the stocks you made that didn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, I hate, I hate it when there's like 10 minutes of talk, two minutes of hunting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. It's a hunting show. Show me hunting. Let's talk about hunting. Let's, uh, let me learn some stuff that that I, maybe I didn't know about. <laughs> right, right. I think, um, and I haven't seen, I only watched that one episode today, uh, Chad, of what you guys do, but I'm definitely looking forward to seeing more. But 
one thing that um, I noticed, you know, to your point about the talking, like I've never been a huge fan of the shows where it's like cut to this guy talking and then we get a different angle of him talking and then we flash back to the hunt. And I think that's kind of what you're hitting on. And I noticed like the style of your guys's video was like just kind of narration over the hunt and like, or you just actually physically being there talking. Do you want coffee that doesn't suck? Get the duck. Dirty Duck Coffee is made specifically for the waterfowl enthusiast. Enjoy flavors like Morning Wood, Dark Dynasty, Cinnamon Teal Snickerdoodle, and First Flight to unlock the flavor that you'll enjoy in the blind for years to come. Our friends at Dirty Duck Coffee Company are now offering all Zero Duck 30 followers a 15% discount when you use code ZeroDuck15 on your next order. During the hunt or during the setup or whatever, so I can totally see that come through on your style of episode too you know yeah i hope we I hope we never change i want it to be i, I kind of want it to be everything of like maybe maybe like the shows that were around when i was young which you know they're long gone but it, it, it oh uncle like ted still the uncle ted still does it right Uncle Tim. <laughs> Uncle Tim plays his guitar too dang much. Uh, sure. I know it. <laughs> I know it. I won't forget the first time that a, a guy that I got into bow hunting, you know, his first year, he, he got really diving into Outdoor Channel and everything. He's calling me all the time. He goes, Dude, you didn't tell me that Ted Nugent was big into bow hunting. And I said, Yeah. He goes, There's nothing more incredible than hearing him play his guitar and shoot a deer. And I grew up like watching like, Fitzgerald Outdoors and, uh, you know, really going back even before even Realtree, you know, the old days on VHS and stuff. The old days, yeah. The, yeah, I forgot. Take, there was this old guy, I can't remember what he used to say, but right before he, he'd open up the show, he'd say, hey, let's go hunt. And he would always say that, and I can't remember who that guy was, but I, I remember those old style videos, man, and, and I totally agree. That's I love what you're doing with that. Yeah, that's what we need. We need to get back to a lot of the old days, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, for sure. For sure, man. So, from a hunting perspective, you know, what's kind of, what's what's your love there, Chad? Do you like wing shooting, or is it, you like everything? I like every, uh, my, I grew up wing shooting, that was, that was, my dad was a big bird hunter and duck hunter, and so, that, that was my first love, too. You know, I love big game, though, it's a, Mm-hmm. It, I got into that after my injury, actually. I, before, I'd only taken one deer. I got gotcha. And it's, it, it, just take elk hunting, for instance, in a chair. That is one of the most challenging things in the world. Oh, my gosh. And, and I, I've always had my heart set on uh, taking an elk with a bow. And do some air quotes for me right now on foot. Yeah. So to me, that's one of the, I've always wanted to do it. And I, and I, I found, you'll see one of the shows, there's this uh, machine called an Outrider Coyote. It's electric, it's like an electric mountain bike. Okay. And it's, and it's totally quiet. And, and that, when I first found that and tried that out, I heard the angels sing and I was like, this is good what I'm going to use to get close enough to an elk someday, you know, hunt them, hunt an elk with a, with a bow during the rut and, and hunt one on foot. It's going to happen someday. So I know how it's going to happen. Hopefully we're going to be able to film and it's going to, because I promise you a quad has never pulled that off yet. Man. Yeah. That, it's it's one of those things that you know getting close like you I've never hunted out west but just like outside looking in with the with the smell and the uh, the sound and man just to get close enough with them uh, with a bow is hard enough already so I'd imagine you know you throw the aspect of the chair in there too uh, just the sound aspect you know oh it's it's definitely gonna happen I've, I've had a couple of close encounters with the with the I, I invented this uh, rickshaw, rickshaw style chair made out of aluminum, and a, I, I did it with antelope hunting in mind, so one person could pull me cross country. Oh, nice! But, well, we started we we started elk hunting, and after a couple of elk hunts, I was like, you know what? If I had this chair, and we were in just the right spot, you know, somebody could could pull me in there, kind of 
we actually had a chance to do that on a rifle hunt and we got really close and the guy we were in the woods my guide actually pulled me up the trail and we had three big bulls around us bugling and he actually oh. called, he called he called the satellite bull up to me where i was sitting there with my with my safety off ready for the shot and it was just it was a small bull i let him go but I was like, dude, that's how it could happen. Could have happened with a bow, just like that. Yeah, and it, it just just that experience was super cool. It was, it, it's, it's something I'm. It's something we're gonna do again. So I know it's doable. That's awesome. And so when you went and where did you go elk hunting at, or where do you go elk hunting at? Well, New Mexico is one of the best places because they have a special mobility impaired season. Okay, which is but but. If I'm going with a bow, I'm I'm putting in with all the other archery archer guys, so I'm gonna have to draw that that bow tag. But they have they have a, a rifle hunt for mobility impaired, which is in between archery and then the regular rifle season. So we kind of have first crack at them. Gotcha. Okay. But it's still extremely hard. Right. It's, right. It's, yeah. It's, I, it's, I heard it's like. Uh, I think they said, I think Cam Han said like public land in, I want to say Colorado, maybe Joe Rogan said that. I think it says like less than a 10% success for a public land elk hunter and with a bow. So I don't know how New Mexico is, but I'm sure it's not, you know, it's got to be comparable somewhat. I, I love those odds, buddy. I love them. <laughs> hey, you just got to keep going. You know how it is. And you know, it's, uh, yeah. you talked about that a lot in the video too. You know, you just... With that young lady, you're like, yeah, we just got to keep going. You got to get out there. It's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, but, it, you know, one thing, uh, and I hope I'm not, like, um, jumping the gun on this, but, you know, uh, one thing that we talk so much about that is um, probably the most important part of what we do is uh, is the experience, right? And it's the people that we meet. And it's the experiences that we share with people, whether it's at hunting camp, you know, and and we talk about it a lot, you know, when it comes to waterfowl hunting, it's a more of a commutative sport, you know, but, and then, you know, you got your deer camps and stuff like that, man. And, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm excited to watch that part of your journey with these folks and, uh, and, and showing, you know, everything in between. It's going to be really awesome. Oh uh, yeah. My, my, one of my favorite things is having group hunts because we bring, we'll bring in we'll bring in people that are just fresh out of the rehab and then I'll have some guys that have been out for a long time and they're really, you know, they know what they're doing and they're hunting. It's just, it, it's such a sharing of ideas or it's good for people just to see other people. They're like, Hey, that guy, that guy's, you know, if that guy can do it, I can get there someday, you know, and, and they, he, I still rip off, rip off ideas from other people sometimes <laughs> hey so what <laughs> it's one of the perks of going on a group hunt I'll, I'll share mine and then if i see something that i'm like man that can work you know so i i, I just I, it just becomes part of my repertoire you know because I, I always see people with different disabilities so many different kind mm -hmm. that there's sometimes you have to make something just custom for one person right something you know you know there there are products out there that are for adaptive shooting fishing whatever sometimes you have to buy that and tweak it a little bit and make it your own mm -hmm. so, but that's, that's one of my expertise now i can i can evaluate someone and say okay this is what you're going to need to to do whatever it is you want so what a special is. uh ability honestly i mean you've been blessed with that for sure because that is like you said earlier on you know about such it's such a niche you know um to be able to to be that resource for people is just uh amazing and i know they just i'm just sitting here thinking about the people that have just got to be so in debt to you for for coming up those those unique instances you know i'm i'm just I'm, I'm, i swear i swear i'm on god's path you know it, <laughs> Every now and then he reveals it. Like, I, you know, I just met a kid last week after the hunt show in the parking lot. There was a kid in a chair getting in. His his parents were there. And I, 
I of course I gotta go meet him. I'm like, hey, you want to hunt and fish? And I, I knew he was, he had a camel shirt on, so I knew his answer. So <laughs> I I was like, all right, what do you want to do? What what have you done? You know, I I, I, I sent him, gave him about three or four leads just to start him off. And we we do a group hunt here in Texas and for teal season in September. We host. A, I may I may try to get him over. So. You just never know who you're gonna meet, who you whose lives you're gonna affect, and you you just you just have to you just have to do what you do, and you know there's so many people out there, people you you'll never hear you'll never hear from them, but you may you may change their lives for the better. I mean that that's why you're doing it. That's why we're here today. Yeah, Chad, what goes into you know you talk about you just saw that young man after a show and just went up and talked to him. But, you know, what goes into, I guess, A, you know, finding the people that you take on the hunts for these videos and B, you know, like the logistical side of it, you know, from a financial standpoint, do you guys have like sponsors that help out with that? Or, you know, how does that stuff work? We have some sponsors. I, I hope we're going to get more now that, now that we're going on carbon TV. I got a little bit more ammunition mm-hmm. <laughs> to approach people with. So it, that's a good question though, about who we take. It's kind of fluid. Mm-hmm. You know, th- sometimes there'll be a hunt somewhere where I get invited by someone else in a chair or with a disability. I'm like, man, this, this would make a good show. Mm-hmm. Or I, I meet someone who's, who hasn't been on a hunt like we're going to go on. And I know they're going to me- just be a great candidate just to go and, and it happens that way. It, it, I just kind of let it happen organically. Yeah. Actually, sometimes I get to hand pick somebody. I'm like, okay, this, you know, this, this person's going to make a, a great, like Kayla. I knew, I knew Kay, what it was going to take to get Kayla out. And I knew it was going to be some trial and error. And it was, and I, I was like, we're, we're definitely going to film your journey, <laughs> no matter what it is, good, bad, or indifferent. We're going to, we're going to film it and see what happens. That's and awesome. So, so far it's been working out right. You know, <laughs> it, It's been working out where all the shows turn out pretty good at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I need to dive in and see. So was it, so you had that was episode six, right? So do you guys have was that the second? Did it say season two, episode six? Well, we 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 shot six episodes so far. We I've got two more that we haven't produced yet. I got you. so on carbon. We're going to start with one and go one through six. It, it, one of the cool ones that I have is we actually filmed our group teal hunt here where we had a blind guy come and hunt and kill a duck in the air. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so I actually had a blind guy about eight years ago come and he and he kind of he kind of blazed the trail, you know, for for everybody else. And he did really well. He he killed like three or four in the air and, and it, I witnessed it, and I was like, "Dude, I just watched this happen. I still don't know how it happened." <laughs> so, all right, this might be a dumb question, but like, is it a scenario where it's like you got a group, and it's just like pull up and shoot, and then he's drop you drop you inherently drop a couple, or is it a thing where it's like just through other senses he can kind of you know it might a water swat a, maybe a, or a wing no, whi- a wing was... whistle you know or something. He uh. It, with the first guy kind of taught us, got us ready for the second guy. Mm-hmm. So the, he, he would, the uh, first guy would sit on a bucket. I had a guy sitting right, one of my buddies right behind him and kind of put one hand, his left hand on his left shoulder and his right hand under his right elbow and kind of guide him. You know, he, he would tell him which way there, he would talk him in and then kind of, kind of just with the pressure, he would know where to where to aim and how to follow, and he he, he was an experienced wing shooter. He would shoot pheasants because they flash. It's in the teens that morning, and maybe you're chasing ducks or geese, but now it's September and it's 85 degrees, and you're hunting early teal or geese. As a waterfowler, you need dependable weather protection that will not break the bank. 
Founded in 1996, Frog Togs is not only the leader in breathable wader technology, but a company you can depend on to keep you warm and dry, head to toe, no matter your hunting environment. Stay bone dry by using discount code ZD315 for 15% off not only your first purchase, like most discount codes, but how about every single purchase you make from now until December 31st, 2024? Straight and they're noisy. Mm. And I was like, that's great that you have that experience, but ducks aren't going to be anything like that. But we'll just, you just get down here and we'll make, we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it worked. And so with the, with the second guy, we, we kind of ended up doing it the same way. And he, he was the only one that shot. He killed one, one by itself in the air right at the end too. It was, I didn't, I didn't think it was going to happen, but it did. It was divine intervention. Yeah, no, it's yeah, definitely one of those things you look back on. You're like, especially towards the end of the hunt, you're like, man, that was meant to be. He, they loved it though because the duck hunting is so noisy. It's uh, because you can hear the ducks flying and falling and hitting the water, and my, and my gun dogs going to retrieve. Mm-hmm. There's just some. I never really thought about that aspect of it, but it really the mosquitoes are noisy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. especially in Texas, right? That's in Texas during teal season, particularly. Yeah. <laughs> so he he called me he called me ten times after that hunt to thank me for inviting him. I was like, dude, you don't have to thank me. Just I'm oh, glad you came and had a great time. <laughs> wow, that's so now, awesome. Now, how does it work, uh, Chad? You know, with like we we started duck hunting in Florida, so I'd imagine it's got to be the marsh environments have got to be similar to marshy Texas. Um, well, I guess first, I, I, I'm assuming if you're hunting teal, you're hunting in like marsh environments down there. Uh, we don't have as much marsh. We got we're, we got a lot of rice fields around us. Okay, I see. So back when I was a kid, all you did was find a rice field that they were in. Second crop, you flood the you flood the field back up, mm-hmm. and the rice will grow again. But there's a lot of rice under the water on the ground. Mm-hmm. And they'll get in those fields and feed. So when I was a kid, all you did was stand on the levee and shoot them as they flew by. And now everybody has flooded ponds and decoys and mojos. It's it's a big deal. And it's totally different than how we used to hunt teal growing up. But it it they're just, you know, they they're the first, they're the last to go back duck right. and they're the first to come back down. Oh, they're so impressive, and uh, we talk about that a lot because we, in Florida, it's one of the states, which I'd imagine parts of Texas may be this way too, but it's one of the states where you can have the opportunity to shoot a fully plumed one pretty regu- you know, regular during the late part of the season. Um, so we've kind of always been enam- enamored by the uh, blue wing teal, um, and to your point, like they have the highest, um, Mort- highest uh, mortality. mortality rate of any of the ducks too, which is crazy. Well, they they're shooting them down there in South America. That's where they're getting shot. We we hardly kill any of them in Texas. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's crazy that over sixty percent of them die every year, dude. It's nuts how how great reproducers they are. I mean, don't even get me started on blue wing teal, bro. I mean, I'm not kidding. Like, I let me let me tell you guys. I'm sorry. I'm inspired right now about we, the blue wing teal. We had a we had a sticker a couple of years ago called blue wing teal purist. Yes, there's guys that are mallard purists, so we thought. It'd be kind of funny. <laughs> so this bird was was the first bird that got me really like stoked, and I went as far. And a lot of people don't know this, but my second duck season, I was in Florida, and it got down to the last day of the season. And I was hunting this WMA that you had to quit at 12. You didn't have to be out at 12. You had to quit at 12. Right. And I was hunting this area that I thought was going to be really good by myself. And I forgot why Tristan couldn't go or whatever. But it was uh, probably less than a mile in from the coast of Ponte Vedra Beach. <laughs> and, uh, and man, this waterway in there, in an intercoastal waterway, I just knew it was going to be fire, and, and it was terrible. And it got, it got to 10 o'clock, and I remembered this one little hole that I saw, and it, it sat down in these long-leaf pine trees, 
And if you know what kind of tree that is, it, it's the it's the skinny tall pine uh, right. that you see in the south. And that season was actually Tristan's first duck hunt. We were sitting there going months back, and I said, "Dude, did you just see those birds fly by?" He goes, "Yeah." And I go, "They just dropped down right in that hole in those longleaf pines." Just and so I looked at it on the map, and I was like. Dude, it doesn't look like nothing's there. And so I went over and peeked over, and what it was, it was a just a little hole, a, a little pond, probably 40 yards in diameter, and half of it was full of cattails. Well, Y'all went and snuck them up? Yeah, so come 10 o'clock that, that last day, I thought, dude, I want a blue-winged teal so bad. Heck yeah. And so I dropped, I took all my decoys, ran them back to the truck, took the truck, drove to like two miles away to another this other spot, got out of the truck, hiked another mile and a half to get there by 11, like 35. Just so I could sneak in through the woods and see if there's anything in this hole. And dude, I go in there and I can't see nothing because it's all cattails and I just blow the shotgun. Boom! And all of a sudden, like 75 blue wing teal get up. <laughs> and I was so new to duck hunting, I didn't know what to do. But if I, man, I just, I, I, I've had bad dreams about this. If you can imagine this bowl that you're in amongst these trees, these ducks get up and they can't go straight out. They have to spin around a couple times to get elevation right. to just get out of there. And man, if I would have been thinking, I would have been, dr- I mean, I might have, shot more than my limit i mean it might have been bad and i hope you picked out a pretty great yeah oh so so i shot and so i shot shot again i watched two fall and they zip out of there well then i didn't know this about teal too is that so many times you and and this is a good tip for y'all if you get up and this is green wings and blue wings if you bust up a group you shoot a big group get ready because they usually try to circle back there to reunite all right and I didn't know that because I was so dumb and new. And next thing you know, here comes about 20 more of this. Zoom, just come in, lightning speed, circle me. And I didn't have a chance, dude. I, I was just like, oh, my God. I just got schooled and what we call getting pooped on. I got pooped on. and uh, But I ended up retrieving one of them. And I, it wasn't like the one on the wall over there fully plumed. But I got that white stripe in the face and that gray head. And man, I really thought that I found something. I mean, I called up everybody I knew. It was like, it was just about, about that one duck that I got that day, that, that blue wing teal. So anyway, that's, sorry. I just did. It's one of my favorite, one of my favorite ducks. To, it's so difficult for us to get a fully plume because, you know, they, they, they really don't get that way around here till like March. Yeah. <laughs> You can get you can get some, you know, if it's an older duck in the last week of the season, you can get one. But they, that's one of the coolest ones. That and cinnamon are like the holy grail. Right. Y'all got cinnamon down there? We got cinnamons closer down to South Texas. Mm. Really? Very yeah. cool. So they they pop up. They show up through here, and and very small pockets but the further you go down south the more that uh, they come up they come up like the rio grande when they come back oh wow because they're coming up they're coming up through mexico to go back up so the one day i want to I, I, I killed one in argentina and my my dad actually killed a prettier one that we had mounted we, this was back when you could bring ducks back mm-hmm. so you can't do it anymore but I, I want to Texas cinnamon someday, so it's going to happen. Yeah, isn't that a whole thing about bringing ducks back kind of funny when it's a migratory yeah. waterfowl? They really fed, they, they really killed killed a lot of duck hunting for that country by doing that. It was stupid. Yeah, I mean, because for Canada? me... No, Mexico. Oh, yeah, well, Canada too. Well, the thing yeah. with Canada, though, is like a lot of people, when you, Canada season, like, they're not fully plumed. I think a lot of people with Mexico, it's like you have the opportunities to kill yeah. some really cool, like plumed out birds. And like, 
you can't bring them back. So I think that's kind of to your point, Chad. Like, you know, for me personally, that would be one of the draws to want to go down there because it's like I don't care about shooting a million ducks yeah. more so than getting a cool species, you know? Oh, and there's uh, down there in South America, there's different species. They have like 25 different species and 20 of them we don't have. Yeah, That's yeah, awesome. that in particular. Holy cow, yeah, it's a good point. Now, now you guys also, I know, I, at least I, I think I'm right about this, and if I'm wrong, then just make me look stupid, but um, <laughs> you guys get some pretty spoonies down there too. We get, yeah, we do, and it, it, it's really under, underappreciated. Uh, sp- uh, sp- Northern shoveler is what it is. Spoon, mm. A spoonie drake in full plume. That's a cool duck. Yeah, yeah it, it is. is. He's on my hit list. It's hard to, it's hard to get him. It's hard to find him full plume. It, it's not easy as you think it would be. Yeah, because I mean, you got to be there in late January. You got to get him in late January. Yep. Right. Yeah. It does. Yeah. They, you know, the pretty much the whole there, it seems like they're one of the ducks that uh, is later on getting plumed out, kind of like the teal. Y'all, y'all will have to, uh, we'll have to swap hunts. Y'all will have to come down here one day and we'll go down South Texas after cinnamon. And uh, I'll, I'll have to come over there. Some I've never duck hunted in Florida. That'd be neat. I'd, I'd love that. And, you know, just from a filming aspect too, you know, I do all the editing and filming of our stuff and I'd love the opportunity to do a hunt and just collaborate. I think it'd be neat. Yeah. And we've, we hunt uh, at several places, you know, this year we're, we got some big goals and we're going to be, um, you know, uh, frog dogs, a big partner of ours. And, and, um, we got a, a, at least a five part series coming out. Do you care if I talk about it, Tristan? I don't care. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're breaking the news right now, live, in that uh, it's called one hell, one hell of a duck season, is what's going to be called. And uh, you know, if you follow us, you know that uh, we always say it's one hell of a life, and that's kind of like our company slogan. Um, but uh, um, we're going to different parts of the country, um, five different environments to show off the um, versatility of, of frog togs. Um, are one of our main partners and, and amongst other partners, I mean, we couldn't get by without our dirty duck coffee, bro. But <laughs> I mean, that's just the truth. We got to have the dirty duck coffee. It's like caffeine. It's like the crack we need. The main, the main thing is our passion's always been hunting in different environments. Um, mm-hmm. just for the personally, just the different, you know, challenges and the different, you know, waterfowl that you'll get in different environments. And, um, we just wanted to put to put together something cohesive, you know, of, you know, a journey, through the whole it. season uh, journey. Yeah. Not because usually, you know, we, our videos have kind of bounced around. It's like, Oh yeah, we're doing these different things, but it's not like a building story arc. So we're going to try to just do it where it's a cohesive thing the whole year. So yeah. To your point. A, yeah. No, but to my cool point, idea. man, is, uh, you know, we hunt a lot of different places and have several connections and we'd love to get with you off air and, and, and plan something together, you know, that we can collab on. And, um, uh, I mean, I, I could feel no better duty than to, to help you and your mission. Um, you know, I, I've I've got a good friend of mine, and when I think about disabilities a lot, my brain always goes to to veterans, just because I'm a veteran, and I've got right. several veterans that um, you know I've got a great friend of mine, uh, Mike Dragic, that runs Project Savior Outdoors, and his whole mission is to simply save uh, people from you know. Marine, uh, veterans, specifically Marines, from committing suicide, because um, yes, yes. that's a disability. You know, it's it's a mental disability, and um, you know, I feel like there's there's such a deep connection between physical disability and mental c- disability, and some people have both. You know, and um, there's nothing better that I could think of doing. So we'll figure something out. Let's let's figure it out. We could make it happen. I know that. Yes, sir. <laughs> So what do you got? Uh, what do you got on the calendar for this season, Chad? Is there anything that's, uh, you know, you're really looking forward to? In the outdoors, every detail counts. See sharper, aim clearer. From the river's edge to the heart of the flooded timber, Hook and Bullet has your vision covered. Hook and Bullet's purpose-built optics are flawlessly crafted to give you an edge, regardless of your outdoor pursuit. Use code zero duck thirty for fifteen percent off a pair of Hook and Bullet sunglasses today. Oh my gosh. So, well, I got a new pup in training, so I can't wait to get him. I'm going to take him 
teal hunting this year for his first hunts. Oh, great. Yeah. What kind of dog? What's his name? He's a chocolate lab boy. His name is Gus. Gus, I love it. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got my I've got an older one, a, a girl named Vegas. That's my eight year old. So she's my she, she's also I had her uh, certified as a service slash therapy dog, so I could take her up to visit people in my rehab. So she, but I, but I need two. It's like having two good running backs. I need a new one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I love, I love, dude. He's telling you're copying off the NFL. You did say you steal stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, no, that's so funny. funny. Hey, and about it's about year eight too for the running back too. You know they you, they come in at twenty two, about thirty. They're probably you know you don't know they might be a little useful still, but they're not you know. Yeah, we we need that running. veteran leadership in the huddle. <laughs> it's uh, it's going to extend her lifespan, her hunting life anyway. Uh-huh. No, but you do. I mean, on the real though, when you talk about dogs like that. You know, um, and I don't want to go down a totally different rabbit hole here, but, you know, I always watch, like, I'm sure a lot of y'all have watched Mountain Man, and you see when they um, they chase these lions and stuff, and oh, it's yeah. huge what the veteran leadership of dogs does for the other one, you know, um, you know, and I love that. It's so cool. that It's such an adaptive uh, thing for the dogs to go through and learn from, like, just like we like they, just like just like they, I told taught you what to do, son. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> There's been actually several times he's taught me what to do, but we, we won't talk about that tonight. <laughs> well, I'm, my my season is going to be mostly bird because I missed I didn't draw any tags out west, so I, I may I'm, I always try to pick pick up a deer hunt in Texas, so I, I'm still in in some draws there, so. I actually, actually got invited by a guy I was on a podcast with. He lives up in, he's a pair. He lives up in New York State, and he invited me to come goose hunt. And I've never, I've always wanted to go Canada goose hunting after the big ones. So we're going. We're going up there in October. We're going to go after those big Canadas. Oh, that's awesome. That's, that's going to be a cool trip. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Get up there in the Northeast and hopefully smack, smack some big honkers. Uh, it's going to be a bunch of bird, a bunch of ducks and doves, and maybe some uh, sandhill crane, and hopefully we'll pick up a big game hunt. I'm I'm always up for that. Yeah, yeah. Now, are you into, uh, you know, with big game and stuff, you know, being such a thing you're interested in, uh, from a cooking standpoint, you know, are you, uh, when it comes to wild game, are you kind of simple, or do you like, do you like, you know, me personally, I'm I'm big into like making all these different. Oh, you're recipes obsessed, bro! It's I, great. I love the cooking aspect of it, and I guess that's just my question. You know, do you like that aspect of it, Chad? I do. I'm gonna send you a recipe for dove and duck. Cause Sounds my, great. My, my mom's from Louisiana, and we were never allowed to breast anything. So I'm gonna I'm gonna send you some pot roasting recipes, and you're gonna to to me dove and teal and axis and sandhill crane are like the top four meat, mm. meat a wild game anyway elks elks up there probably number five and so with those those four they're really good so we're, the, we're gonna we're gonna collaborate on that yeah that well good. i can't if you said your mom if you got some stuff come from my louisiana bro do you got something for coot <laughs> the, hey i get you something for coot buddy. all right some, let's go I got some operatives, uh, got some coot recipes. <laughs> you know, I got four. I was fortunate enough to hunt with some folks from uh, Louisiana during uh, snow goose season out Delta Thunder Outfitters this year in Arkansas. And, uh, you know, it's so much, it's so fun learning the culture of people. I, I was guiding them and, and uh, we're shooting these snow geese. And for so many clients, they're just like, you want them, you know? And, and so many of us just like, we take as much as we can get, but at some point, you know, we might donate some to, to the state of Arkansas or whatever it is. And, uh, yeah. these guys were like, who's getting what? And they were fighting <laughs> over the snow geese, like fight. No, I'm, I'm no lie. And they're like, you don't even know what you're in for. And I go, I guess I don't. And they made these things called snow goose bombs. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I'm telling you what, man. And, Everybody there that was was there that was not from Louisiana was in total shock. 
It was hey, hey. incredible, dude. And what they did, and I don't know the whole recipe, but they basically took a a, a, a breast and uh, cut it in half, like kind of like you're cutting into a hot dog bun. All right. And they took that and they filled it with cream cheese and jalapeno. And then they take that and wrapped it in bacon. This with is that. a big jalapeno popper. Uh, dude, the... I'm not kidding you. When they cut that thing into p- slices, <laughs> everybody in camp was in, like, it felt like you was like, you warped into a different time. <laughs> it was something stupid. I, I mean, today it's like, did, was that really, did that really happen? <laughs> I mean, it was so incredible. And I just, I love that, you know, and so now I'm hooked on Louisiana cooking. So you know, that, what they, you know what their you know what their motto is, don't you? What's that? If you can't dance with it or make love to it, you eat it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they 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 figured out how to eat everything there is. And there, you know, there really is such an art to just like the preparation of game. You know, I think, um, you know, to your you talking about the coots or, yeah. you know, whatever it might be like, um, I've had a, I'm still trying to figure out duck because like I've, one of the recipes I did that, um, I really like, uh, it came from meat eater and it's, um, basically you make like a mold wine and, uh, you like cook the pears, some pears in it. So you're kind of serving the duck over like a bed of onions and like you're pouring this mold wine on the pears yeah. and the duck and everything and you bake it and, uh, it's really good, um, but I cooked the exact same the exact same way, um, a ring neck and a pintail, and I couldn't tell the difference <laughs> in those two ducks, you know, and they both tasted amazing, but I just think so much of it comes down to how you prepare it, you know? Yeah, well, and don't even get me started, man, and, and Chad, I tell you. At least with duck. I, yeah, I'm big on this, and I don't know if you've ever thought this before, but I'm going to blow your mind right now, and that is... You know this. So when you hunt big game, right? If you wound one, what happens is is adrenaline gets shocked through that meat, right? Oh yeah. Which is why they swiftly execute um, cattle, et cetera. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean that's why you do it. You know, right? Is that you want that? So my whole big thing is, I can tell. I know for a fact that every single deer that I've had buck or doe that it was wounded that i ate and y'all i'm not talking about like a gut shot and gut getting in the meat i'm just talking about from the adrenaline in the blood if you take a cow and you stress that thing out for an hour knowing it was going to die and then you shot it dude it's not going to be good any meat person will tell you that my whole thing is that waterfowl is so small that we don't we lose track because you know let's say you go out and you shoot a four man and then you shoot 24 ducks well, dude, who is sitting there going, those are the ones that were crippled. Those are the ones that were were adults, you know, yada, yada, yada. And I think that what you're really dealing with, with distaste, there's definitely a taste difference between different ones, but general distaste, I guarantee you, and I'm going to, I'm going to prove this if it's the last thing I do before I pass away, is that <laughs> it's red meat. It's no different. And if you. If you took a batch of cripples of the best tasting duck in the world, I guarantee you it's not going to taste as good as one that you just swiftly shot out of the sky. It's so not. We should we should keep the cripples separate and the uh, and the like keep an eye on them that way you know when you're cooking them. Yeah, yeah. So that's my kind of my philosophy. Now I set out to do this last year with snow geese, and I don't have enough samples to really say. I, I've got some Rossies. I've got some some blues i've got a, a regular snow i've got some samples <laughs> i do i'm saving them <laughs> dude i'm saving them i'm saving them over there and i just went through them the other day and i was like damn it i don't really have enough to do a video on this yet but that's where i'm going with all this and and uh hopefully one day i'm going to be a millionaire for 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 having a philosophy that's un patentable and unable to make any money from. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that translates to being a millionaire, but yeah, I don't either. I don't either. I just want to be the first person to prove something, I guess. Uh, you never know. That's a theory. You can prove it. That's right. That's right. You don't hear about the guy that proved a theory to go to the moon, right? You just hear about the guys that flew to the moon. 
That's right. Alleged, <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. That's right. Allegedly. <laughs> no, right. I think it would be an interesting YouTube video, though. Yeah, yeah, no. But no, I'm I'm interested in that. But I'll tell you, I just love learning the culture of how people make stuff. And, and like you said, uh, the folks down in L.A., man, they uh, they know how to take something and make it very tasty. Yeah, you're making me hungry. I think we're going to have to talk <laughs> I'm going to make a freaking frog leg gumbo or something after this. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dad says that Guinea makes the best gumbo. Yeah? Yes. So, the to, to, a guinea fowl? Guinea. Yeah, the guineas, the the ones that people keep in their yards as watchdogs. <laughs> the guineas, guineas supposedly makes the best watchdog and the best gumbo. No kidding. <laughs> so, you, you, I don't I don't know if you have any in Florida, but I'm no. sure you could get your hands on some. No, no. No, that's funny. <laughs> I told you we'd go off in the weeds every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. I love it. Well, Chad, man, we, we appreciate your time, man. We don't want to take too much of it. And, uh, you know, we loved having you on tonight and definitely want to have you on again in the future. You know, tell people, you know, where they can get in touch with you and also, you know, where to look for carbon carbon out or is it it's on carbon tv um right that able outdoors is coming out on it's gonna be on carbon tv on september 5th is when you could i think you can just search able outdoors we have a youtube channel and hopefully we're gonna get some podcasts going on carbon too that they, they have they have outdoor shows and podcasts on there so good deal they, they have they have it on their site how you can how you can find it there's an app and we also have a website, ableoutdoors.net. I'm, I mean, we're easy to find. Just Google, just Google it. <laughs> ten Good. four, ten four. And I look forward to us. Let's uh, let's set up a, let's set up a time that we can all kind of get together and collab and talk a little. Actually, you, I'll let you and Tristan do it because Tristan really has the vision of everything. But um, let's get together and uh, let's figure it out, man, off air, and uh, see what we can do to collab on something. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm down. Sounds great, guys. Yeah, it'll probably have to be something next season just because of time and work and stuff. But uh, sure. definitely would love to do that. And uh, we're looking forward to following along with uh, what you guys do. And um, I just think you guys got a great thing going there, Chad. Hey, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me on. I loved it. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. So happy to help spread the message. All right, Chad. Appreciate your time. Have a good one. Hey, you got it, guys. Hey, we'll talk soon, buddy. Yes, All sir. Right, have a good, good night. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. I've been southbound. I've been hellbound. Riding on the midnight train. Going too fast now. Think I'll slow down. Standing in the pouring rain.